Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. I'm your host Vaughn Troidy and I am the Steampunk Desperado. This is the place where we review that most wonderful of all fictional genres, steampunk, which is a variety of science fiction that deals not just with the future but also with the past. We have alternate histories, we have adventures in time, we have Victorian romances and steam steam uh, steam car chases and airship battles and all that great adventure. So we will be reviewing all sorts of works of steampunk fiction right here. Today we will be talking about a classic novel, one of the forerunners of steampunk, called The Warlord of the Air, published in 1971 and written by a guy named Michael Moorcock. Those of you who know fantasy and science fiction have certainly heard of Moorcock. He's one of the most prolific authors. He's written dozens of books. Uh, most, mostly, I believe, fantasy, although a fair number of science fiction as well. And he has recurring characters, which he uses throughout different series. One in it from his fantasy series it was called Elric of Melniborn. Another from his science fiction world, Jerry Cornelius. Uh, this book, Boiler of the Air, is a alternate history. It's got a wonderful Victorian atmosphere and a fantastic vocabulary, lots of, lots of uh, British type eloquent speech. It's just wonderful. Now, it was, in, it was written before the term steampunk was invented, but certainly, certainly with all these, all these aspects, we have to consider it steampunk, even if there was no word for it back then. It starts out with a narrator, an un unnamed narrator, who's living on a remote island in the Indian Ocean. Ostensibly, he's Marcock's grandfather, who had this really responsible job, uh, and I think in the government, I forget, and it was so stressful that he had to, he had to take a break. Anyway, this narrator has recovered from his stress in his island paradise, and he's bored now. He's down at the docks one day, and the ship comes in, and they throw this guy off. He's like this drunken madman. He's a stowaway, so they... They throw him off, and, and the narrator thinks, hmm, this guy probably has an interesting story. I think I'll go talk to him. So he does, and he goes and buys the guy a drink, and the guy starts telling him his story, which turns out to be pretty fantastic. This fellow is called Oswald Bastable, and he was a, an officer in the British Army in India. Uh, anyway, Bastable had been in India and part of the army and he's a he's a solid reliable guy so they send him to lead an expedition up to the mysterious kingdom of Teku Bengu in Himalayas and this is one of those many little kingdoms that the British are trying to consolidate to, to cement their rule over the subcontinent this guy who, who the king of this place is rumored to be a sorcerer and a very very feared among his neighbors so the British figure, if they can get him in their fold, they, they've got it made. Everybody else is, gonna, is going to follow as well. But it turns out that this guy is, is kind of crazy. And in, the, in the, the process of the meeting that uh, Bastable and his people are having, there's this big disaster and this cataclysm and this earthquake. And in the, per, in the process of fleeing for his life, Bastable falls down this chasm and bonks his head and is knocked unconscious. When he wakes up, he thinks, oh, it's maybe been a day or two. And I, he comes out and the place is deserted. And there, it looks like that it's been deserted for ages. And the, the road is, is fallen down. So he's trapped up here on the side of the mountain. And none, none, other, none other than a British airship appears, just out of luck. They see him there waving his hands in this deserted city, and they come and pick him up. They were like an archaeological team to investigate the city, and they hadn't expected anybody to be alive there. It turns out that the year is 1973. Somehow, Bastable has been transported into the future without aging. 
and he decides right then and there he's not going to tell anybody because they're certainly going to think he's crazy and put him in, in, into an insane asylum. This 1973 in Warlord is not our 1973. It's very, very different. It's kind of the way a Victorian author might have envisioned the future unfolding, and which is what, one of the reasons it's, it's so wonderful. In this history, the great empires never fell. The British still rule India. They still rule Canada and Australia and half of Africa. In fact, they're more powerful than ever. It's like a utopia because the world wars never happened. The, there's, there's prosperity, there's been progress, peace. No communism, no Nazism, no, no Holocaust. Again, it's like a utopia. At least that's what Bastable felt, and that's what a lot of us would think if we saw this world. Now, the technology is a little different because, and it makes sense because the lack of those world wars. The wars were what spurred on aviation in, in a great degree. And so in this world, they don't have airplanes. They do have great airships, Zeppelin-like, things like the Hindenburg. Only I believe they've switched to helium, so it's, they're not going to blow up. So, Bastable, being this uh, army veteran, he has all these skills, and it's pretty easy for him to go through school and, and take the test and become an airship employee. And he gets a job on one of the greatest, most luxurious and exclusive commercial airliners of the world, and that is the Loch Etive. Uh, it's a Scottish lake, kind of like Loch Ness, only less famous. And uh, he really enjoys this occupation. It's great. He's seeing the world. He's seeing this, this utopian system, or at least so he thinks anyway. He believes it's a utopia. And one of the most fun things about steampunk, and that's, as, uh, that's the case for this book as well, is that we like to write, we like to include, and I say we because I've also written steampunk, we like to include real life characters in our books. Real life characters in this book include Winston Churchill, who also had an important role in the Empire, and also Ronald Reagan. <laughs> now this Ronald Reagan is not our Ronald Reagan, just like this 1973 isn't our 1973. He is not a politician, he's a Boy Scout leader. And Reagan is Bastable's nemesis. He's a racist, he's a prude, he's always complaining. And the, the uh, climax comes when Reagan throws a fit when he's seated in the dining room with his boys next to a table full of Indian civil servants. And they're like dark skinned and, and Reagan takes offense to that. So he, he starts screaming the N-word and causing a ruckus, and, and Bastable tries to calm him down, but he won't calm down, so he ends up punching him in the face, which uh, he basically defuses the situation, but at the same time, they have to fire him, because he hit a passenger, no matter how out of line that passenger was. Bastable's in disgrace, and he's sent back to Great Britain to find another job. And he comes in contact with a Polish emigre, this guy is Captain Kordzanowski. He runs an airship called the Rover. It's kind of a rust bucket. Definitely a rust bucket compared to the Loch Etive. And he offers Bastable a job. Bastable accepts it because he doesn't have a lot of choice. And there's a lot of interesting and bohemian characters in this story. And that includes uh, some people that, he's, that Bastable su suspects may be radical, revolutionary, anarchist terrorists. Because at the time, as I said, it seems like a utopia, but there are people who are dissatisfied, of course, especially regarding the colonies. All these colonies that, that Britain particular rules, like India and, and Africa and so on, there are, are people who are very dissatisfied with being oppressed. Bastable is a good guy and he understands that he believes in justice and whatnot and freedom, but he also loves his country, so he doesn't, doesn't condone this kind of violent revolution. So he's planning to turn these guys in the next chance he gets. And uh, 
He doesn't get the chance, though, because they happen to go to China. And in China, there's all these different countries ruling different pieces of it, just like was true in our historical 19th century. The what's left of China that's independent is very weak and full of opium addicts. And there's a guy there called the Warlord of the Air, Shu Ho Ti, and he is the um, pirate that everybody fears because he preys on Western shipping. And of course, as you would expect from the title, he attacks the rover and either kills or takes prisoner all the crew members. And Abbasable is one of those who's taken prisoner. And Shu, Shu or Sho is not really a bad guy. He, he treats his prisoners pretty well, but they're not free to go unless they join his revolution because he's not just a pirate. He's actually doing this to bring his country back into power, to make China great again. And he's going to kick out all the foreigners and restore his country to his former glory. Bassable, of course, is a patriot and he doesn't want to betray his country, but at the same time, he begins to realize that Sho is right and that he has to do something about this injustice. I'm not going to go into detail about what happens next because I don't want to give away the entire plot of the book. We know, however, that he is part of two sequels to this book, which I have not read yet. Um, Land of Leviathan and the, the Steel Tsar, that is like Tsar, Russian, Russian Emperor. And I do intend to read those at some point. So we assume that Bastable maybe cleaned up his act at some point. To sum up, I really love this book. It was a great fun, it was adventures in an imaginative setting, a very great Victorian period feel, lots of lots of descriptive flowery language, which those of us who love steampunk are really into. As far as rating, I rate my reviews on a system of five gears being a perfect score. Not stars, but gears, because it's a steampunk, and we like gears like this. So I gave Warlord of the Air a score of 4.5 out of 5 gears. I could not give it a perfect score because of Ronald Reagan. I understand that that uh, Moorcock is a leftist and the leftist never did like Ronald Reagan, uh, even before he was president. But I think it's really unfair portraying him as a racist. So that's my review for Warlord of the Air written in 1971 by Michael Moorcock. Whether you read the book and perhaps had a different opinion on it, I would very much like to hear about it. So I'd like to thank you very much for being here with us for this, for this uh, video segment. And come back again soon and see more reviews of the most wonderful genre of science fiction called steampunk. For now, this is Vaughn Troidy. The Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.